So this is from a recorded talk. So we should establish our mindfulness with our breath, with our in-breath and our breath, and use this as the uh, foundation, the focal point of our mindfulness. So the sati uh, is mindfulness or recollection, and then there's sampajanya, this complete self-knowing, self-awareness. And in the practice that we kind of engage in, in Buddhism, uh, these qualities of mindfulness and sampajanya, um, they bring great benefit. These are two qualities that have great benefit. And we see with other qualities, such as samadhi, that if there's too much of that, and we just find happiness in those states of absorption, then we won't contemplate. You see the jhanas of recluses, and it's in the time of the Buddha, and they could get into very profound uh, levels of absorption, and there were many who could do that. Uh, but this didn't take them to awakening. And this is also true for wisdom as well, that if there's too much wisdom, then the mind will just be unsettled and scattered. But this recollection, or sati, this is a quality that's very important, and the more we have of it, the better. And when we establish this sati well, then wisdom will come following. And this wisdom knows in line with truth, and it's able to solve all of the problems within our hearts. So we establish our mindfulness well, establish it on the breath, or using a meditation word, this is fine too. And there are different bases um, to establish our mindfulness on, to develop this mindfulness. And these are important. And so the first is that of the body, and then there's the feelings. Uh, the third is the mind, and the fourth is Dhamma. So when Lumpur Cha taught, he gave the principles of the practice for the laity uh, to follow. But he said that they shouldn't take it too far, or they shouldn't kind of torture themselves too much. They shouldn't bring up too much difficulty. For example, it's not appropriate to sit in meditation for very long periods so that a lot of bodily pain comes up and to just endure with that. But rather, we just do what we're capable of doing. And whether we're standing, we're sitting, we're walking, we're lying down, um, we try to establish mindfulness there and try to do that as best as we can in line with the energy and the resources that we have, and try to meditate, have formal periods of meditation in line with what we're able to do. And so perhaps there can be one period in the morning, one period at night for 30 minutes each, or maybe just one session for one hour. And this is... If we can do this, if the laity can do this, then this means that they're practicing well. But what's really important is to make this practice even and consistent. Because there are many hours during which we have to work, and it's important to have a lot of mindfulness while we do this. And because we're with a lot of people, surrounded by many individuals, and surrounded by many emotions and many sense impressions. And when we cognize these, when we receive these, then we have to be able to contemplate in a manner that allows us to put these down, to lay them aside, so that we don't cling to them. Because if we attach, then this will cause uh, ignorance, craving, clinging to come up within the mind. And then it'll just be chaotic and stirred up. It'll get involved in feelings 
of love and hate and fear. So we need to train ourselves well. And this is especially so in our households. So we really need to establish a mindfulness well in the home. Because it's really easy when we're with our family members uh, for us to get distracted or for us to lose our mindfulness. So we must make sure that we establish this well and really take care of our words, of our speech, and make sure that these are moral and good words. Make sure that the things we say are true, are honest, that they're pleasant to hear, they're not coarse, uh, they're not harmful. And so we try to do this. And if we can practice in the way, in this way, then all of the people in our household will benefit, they'll all get happiness from this, the happiness of sila. And as we develop and keep each aspect of these precepts, each of the five precepts, um, then the happiness that we gain from uh, outside will increase as well. And this will allow for our mindfulness to develop, for our meditation to progress as well. So some people ask, well, how long will it be until we know the Dhamma, until we attain to the Dhamma? Because they see during the time of the Buddha and that there were many people who listened to the teachings of the Buddha just once and they could gain these noble fruits, um, attain to the level of Sotapanna, a stream enterer, or a Sakadagami, a once-returner, Anagami, non-returner, or Arahant. And they could do this without much difficulty. But that's because the Bharami that they had created already, developed already, was a lot. And also the Buddha was able to perceive their disposition and their temperament, so he could teach them accordingly. And then through listening to the teachings, they could attain to the Dhamma. But that was because the strength of their Bharami was there, that it had already created a lot of goodness, a lot of merit in the past. So the Buddha, before he taught, he used his special knowledges um, to be able to see into the minds of those he was teaching and to see who would be able to know. And each uh, morning he did this, he spread his awareness and was able to see who, would, who was ripe for attaining to the Dhamma. This is also true when... Yasa, uh, the son of a very wealthy family in Varanasi, uh, came across the Buddha. And just from that first teaching that the Buddha gave him, um, he attained to stream entry. And then his parents, his mother and father, also attained to stream entry. And the Buddha knew that this would happen beforehand. And then in no long time, Yasa himself attained to arahantship. And so the Buddha knew this. But uh, Venerable Yasa, his mother and his father, they had also cultivated a lot of Bharami in the past as well. And so they were able to attain to Magapala Nibbana without much difficulty through listening to the Buddha's teachings. So for us in this life, we're very fortunate. We've been born as humans. We have this wealth of a human body. So we should also try to develop our minds so that we become 100% human. Develop our mindfulness, the sati, the sampajanya, um, this self-awareness, this full self-awareness, enough to be able to, all these bodies give us that ability to be able to practice the Dhamma. And then as we do this, then we'll be able to see the Dhamma. And we see that there are many beings who are simply incapable of doing this. They just can't attain to the Dhamma. But for us, we have this great opportunity. So we should use this well, use this to study the teachings, and also to develop our faith that we have in the Buddha. 
to really set our hearts on cultivating goodness. Uh, for example, um, making offerings, offering food. And then we come to develop our meditation, to chant, uh, to sit, and to establish our mindfulness well. So we establish this mindfulness over the breath, or we can use one of med- these meditation words or mantras, Buddha, for example. So this word Buddha, what that means is the one who knows, the awakened one, the joyful one. And as we carry on reciting this, this word Buddha, Buddha, then our mind will come into peace. And when it comes into a peaceful space, uh, through this mantra, then the mind will gain knowledge. And when the mind gains knowledge, then it's really reached the state of Buddha already. Because this knowledge has arisen within it. And when there's knowledge and there's stillness there within the heart, then it'll be able to suppress the defilements. It'll be able to put the hindrances at bay. These hindrances of delight in sensuality, of ill will, sloth and torpor, uh, restlessness and skeptical doubt, that these just won't arise. And these are the things which work to obstruct the mind from being able to experience its own inner peace and goodness. So the Buddha taught that we should practice in this way. And as we do this, then our meditation will progress, and it will progress incrementally in stages, until it's able to suppress these defilements uh, through samatha practice. And even though this is just samatha, it's just the calming of the mind, it's something that is necessary. Because if we're lacking inner peace, and then we simply won't be able to contemplate in a way that allows us to see the nature of our bodies and our minds with clarity. So we do need this foundation of peace, of calm, in order to contemplate, investigate into this body, see it as being a collection of earth, water, fire and air, see it as being something which eventually must break down um, when it's reached its time to break apart. It's not temporary, it's not sure, it doesn't last. That it's just something that is stressful, something that changes, something that's not self, and this is its law according to its nature. So when Venerable Yasa listens to the teachings of the Buddha, what the Buddha taught him was about dana, sila, and bhavana, generosity, morality, and meditation and the benefits of this. And what this gives us is happiness. But when we receive this happiness, this is something which too is not sure, something which also changes, which doesn't last forever. Because it's still a happiness which is caught within this realm of birth and death. So the Buddha then taught him about the dangers of birth and death, taught him about nekama, renunciation, about training the mind so it reaches peace. And when the mind has reached the state of inner calm already, when it's not tied to any uh, delight or any attraction, when it's not gone off into aversion, then it will meet with stillness. And when his mind was in the still and calm place, the Buddha taught him about the Four Noble Truths, about the truth of dukkha, um, stress or suffering, uh, samutaya, the cause of this, niroda, its cessation, and maga, the path leading to that cessation of suffering. So as he contemplated this, then he gained an understanding, and this understanding took him to stream entry. But he was able to do this because he had already cultivated this, he had already developed his character, developed his barami. And the results of that prior development were sending there, uh, were fruiting in his present life. So therefore for us in our present lives, we should cultivate these qualities a lot, really practice a lot. Even though we may live in a family, even though we may have many duties, much work to do, uh, still we try to develop 
uh, the Dhamma, try to cultivate this path. Because the Dhamma is something which gives results independent of time. It doesn't discriminate between people, between gender, male or female. So therefore we should really set our hearts on developing goodness, on cultivating our minds, and do this every single day. On the weekends or the days that we have off, then we should make a special effort to sit to meditation, um, to take up this quality or this, uh, or take up nekama, this renunciation, to develop this parami, and really seek out and apply ourselves to this practice. And so we do so in line with the energy in line with the resources that we have. And we just carry on reciting these mantras, reciting Buddha, 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 until the mind gathers together and reaches peace. And in this state, then joy will arise and become firmly um, embedded within the heart. And this, these qualities of peace, collectedness, and this firm establishment, um, these fall into the noble path this path of sila, samadhi, and panya, of virtue, collectedness, and wisdom. And this path, this noble path, it is the fast way, the quick way, the shortcut. It's not slow at all. And so we just practice this, and this will lead us to inner peace. And then when we gain inner peace, then we'll reach into the very heart of Buddhism. 